Today we're going to talk about why all those visualizations and meters in your door and your plugins matter so much. So first things first, let's cover some basics. In a DAW, there's a series of meters, visualizations, and ways to measure sound. Some of the common ones that you're gonna come across in every DAW are going to be things like your peak meter. This will commonly be found on the mixer interface of the DAW, but many plugins will also have a peak meter as well. Another really common one that you'll come across is a gain reduction meter. And you'll see this commonly on things like compressors, limiters. All modern DAWs will come with some kind of frequency analyzer, often built into an EQ, which is the most prevalent place to be able to view it. Some DAWs will also include things like oscilloscopes and a good vector scope as well. And then we've got additional metering, being able to measure things like RMS and LUFS has become considerably more important as more and more of the music production process is handled inside a single program like your door. So let's address the first one. A peak meter is usually representative with three colors, green, yellow, and red. Green being a signal input, yellow being reaching the threshold of ideal input, and red being near clipping or exceeded clipping. This can vary from DAW to tool. Some will go red right as they're near that threshold to let you know you're a little too close. And the variation of where yellow will appear can be wide varying as well. Now a peak meter will always have a value alongside it of dB. So this is going to be the number of decibels being fed into that meter and it's telling you the overall value. Common is minus 60 up to zero. Some peak meters will show above zero depending on what they're emulating. If you're recording, like I'm recording a VO right now, I want to be able to see that the signal is comfortably in the green range, even at a louder vocal moment. I don't want it to go too far up and be reading in the red. This is the most base use of a peak meter to see those values and how loud a sound is and how loud a sound is in its momentary instance in terms of decibels. It makes for gain staging to be a lot simpler as well. For example, if we have an audio input that's peaking at say, minus six, and we insert a plugin or tool on that channel, and we can then see that its relative peak meter is now peaking at minus three, we know whatever process we have introduced there is somehow adding three decibels of gain. And we can then reduce that back down so it's back at minus six, thus gain staging the signal and not continuously adding unwanted loudness, which can add to the feeling of louder is better and also cause problems with headroom in your mix. It's key to note though that peak meters are not overall loudness. The master track on your mixer may be peaking at minus one dB, but that track could still be considerably louder and loudness isn't measured in a peak value. This is where meters like the RMS or the more commonly used now LUFS meter come into play and they're a measurement over time. RMS was roots mean squared and when I first started mastering for a radio station, RMS was the value we went to and we used that to get an equal and comparative loudness for the voiceovers and interviews that I was working on mastering so that they would be relative to other music and background music that could be played in. By having a relatively consistent RMS value, we could get those levels to be roughly where we needed them to be. LUFS is a way more accurate and measured to the human ear and its hearing way of doing that and is now the current standard of measuring loudness. Loudness and LUFS measurement is usually associated with the mastering phase of your music. When your music is finally ready, it's been processed into a final mastered file. We look to achieve that key loudness and then distribute your music out to the major platforms, be that for download or the streaming stores. I use a distributor called DistroKid. They get all of my music out to all of the major platforms and they do that at a price 
less an independent artist can easily afford. If you'd like to learn more, check out the link below, which will also give you a discount off of your first year today. The frequency analyzer shows the incoming audio across the spectrum of frequency. Most commonly, we're going to see 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, which is commonly accepted as the range of human hearing. As a result, this is one of the reasons it's really useful to have something like frequency analysis. Whereas our ears are not necessarily perfect and we can't always perceive exactly what's going on, our frequency analyzer doesn't lie. It shows us exactly what is happening with that piece of audio. If there is perhaps a translation up in the extreme high end that we can't quite hear or perceive, but it shows that it's hugely peaking on a frequency analyzer, well, we know that we're not picking that up, but it's going to cause issue. And our analyzer has given us a visual indication of that, which has done the job. Similarly can be said for the low end. Even on monitors like this, they don't go all the way down to the lowest of frequency. A frequency analyzer will show us exactly what's going on in that zone. Many DAWs will have a spectral mode built in. If not, tools like Isotopes RX also support this. Spectral analysis allows us to see things we wouldn't necessarily get with other metering or that we're unlikely to be able to always perceive. If we open up something that plays chords, for example, in a spectral analyzer, we can usually see exactly where those notes lie, giving a really good visual indicator to find key areas or problems, or perhaps a single note in a chord that might need to be pulled back with EQ. No metering, in my opinion, is complete without a vector scope. A vector scope gives us an idea of what's going on in both the left and the right channels and how they relate in terms of phase. So when we're working in stereo, we can have a signal on this side that doesn't go well with this side. So when we bring them together, they'll cancel out. A vector scope helps us avoid those issues by giving us a visual indicator of phase correlation dependent on the frequency and signal. If we look at the one in ozone here, it shows us a nice spread of the audio, where it's going in terms of left and right, how well correlated it is, and our correlation meter will move up and down depending if there is something going on. The other useful thing about this is it can be split into multiple bands. So we can test the phase correlation of the low end versus, say, the middle where the vocal and snare are sitting. I believe understanding a vector scope can greatly improve your overall mix. Check out this video next where I break down exactly why that's so important. I'll see you in the next one.